Welcome everyone to tonight's 12th installment of FAFP's COVID-19 webinars. My name is Dr. Chris Scuderi and I've had the pleasure of chairing the FAFP's COVID-19 Task Force, which continues to lead the FAFP's efforts to assist the Florida family physicians and their staff in dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. Tonight's presentation, Long-Term Follow-Up of COVID-19 Patients for Family Physicians, will feature three specialists who will address manifestations of COVID-19 from a cardiovascular, neurological, and pulmonary perspective. Our speakers will briefly review current treatment protocols for each of these manifestations and discuss long-term prognosis and follow-up care. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's highly respected panelists, all three from the University of Florida College of Medicine, Jacksonville. First, Dr. Constance Katsifanis, who is an assistant professor who serves as the associate program director for the Department of Neurology and the Vascular Neurology Fellowship. Next, we have Do Dr. Dominic Angelillo, who is a professor in the Department of Cardiology, serving as the medical director for the programs of cardiovascular research and the Interventional Cardiology Fellowship. And finally, Dr. Lisa Jones, who is an associate professor and chief in the Division of Pulmonary, Critical Care, and Sleep Medicine. She's the medical director for the Medical Intensive Care Unit and assists with the Pulmonary Critical Care Fellowship. So as you can tell, we have a very accomplished panel of specialists to lead tonight's webinar. Thank you all for participating. Before we begin, just a reminder that similar to all FAFP webinars, participants will be in listen-only mode, but you can type questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen that your presenters and I can see. We will attempt to answer your questions either during or at the end of the presentation. Okay, let's get started with the first presentation. Dr. Katsifanis, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the neurologic sequelae of COVID-19 um, and what that means for you guys as um, family practice physicians and how you're going to follow these patients as they, um, as they go through their journey with this particular virus. Slide, please. So based on what we know from studying previous coronaviruses, this is not our first rodeo with a coronavirus, right? There are, they're ubiquitous, they're all over the place. And based on what we know from studying previous coronaviruses, CNS and peripheral nervous system disease was initially expected to be pretty rare. I mean, you don't see a bunch of people in, in the hospital with GBS syndrome from a common cold or people with long-term headaches every time they catch a cold, right? Like they get better and they move on with their lives. But our patients are beginning to show us that this is unfortunately not the case with this particular disease. Slide, please. We're seeing a wide range of problems, both acutely and um, out as we move through patients' recovery. First of all, and probably most seriously, we're seeing strokes, um, as well as encephalopathy, GBS, of course, lack of taste and smell, um, ADEM, which is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which is a particularly nasty disease that looks a lot like MS, but hits hard, hits fast, and hits once. Um, hemorrhage, uh, because you know, it's not bad enough that you're clotting, you're bleeding too. Venous sinus thrombosis and meningitis. So all of these things are occurring in our patient populations and we're learning more and more about them as we go on. Uh, slide please. What we know so far from patients who have recovered, um, we're seeing more and more patients who have recovered from COVID-19. And this means that we'll be providing chronic care to these patients long after the acute illness has passed. This means this is true for both family practice physicians and for subspecialty physicians like myself. What can you as family practice physicians expect and what should you refer to a specialist? There's a lot of this that you guys can actually handle on your own. Um, and of course, there's always specialty and subspecialty support. But as this virus becomes even more ubiquitous than it already is, you're not gonna wanna wait to send your patient to a specialist if it's something that you can possibly help them navigate on your own. Slide, please. COVID patients have recorded several long-term neurologic sequelae, and these include things like headache, vertigo, confusion and brain fog and those are the those are the things that I'm going to address right now. Um, these are cringeworthy complaints um, for lack of a better term because they're they're awful they're non-discreet they're 
they're everywhere and they affect every aspect of the patient's life. Headaches are terrible. They're debilitating um, and they can lose hours to days of time. Vertigo is kind of a, a simmering complaint. Um, it's something that's always there in the background for a lot of these patients and causing them a lot of day-to-day uh, -day disability. Um, you know, they can't, they can't do things with their kids. They don't feel safe driving. They're worried about walking around their homes. Uh, it's, it's a great way to make somebody a prisoner in their own body. Like they're afraid to move, they're afraid to fall. And then confusion and brain fog. This is often a complaint that I get from people's spouses. Um, this is something that's been real challenging with COVID uh, as we had this time where we didn't have any visitors in visits. And I would get patients and I would say, hi, why are you here today? And the patient would just look me dead in the face and say, I have no idea. And so then you're having to call family members and, you know, kind of go through on the phone. And it turns out that a lot of these post-COVID patients are having this, this brain fog there. It's an extreme version of, I walked into the room and forgot I was there. It's, I forgot that this room was someplace in my house, like, and it takes them a minute to, to kind of reorient themselves. Slide, please. So first we'll talk about headaches. Um, the headaches are present in a large chunk of people um, who have suffered and recovered from COVID-19. And the interesting thing about these headaches is they're not just seen in patients with severe disease. They're seen in patients even who were mild or asymptomatic. So sometimes um, in the past couple of months, I've gotten a patient who has had this really persistent headache that just showed up out of the blue. And I'll say, you know what? I'll send them for antibody testing and they'll turn out to be antibody positive, meaning that they had had COVID at some point and been asymptomatic. And now they have this headache that they can't get rid of. Where correlation does not prove causation, I'm starting to see this often enough that I'm, I'm beginning to suspect uh, that there's, there's a link there. These headaches are difficult to treat, both acutely and chronically. Sometimes we see these headaches show up in patients while they're hospitalized with COVID and we get consults for that in the hospital. But sometimes we see these show up um, in the weeks to months after uh, the coronavirus infection. The headaches have occurred both in people with a primary headache disorder, such as migraine, tension headaches, or cluster headaches, and as well as pati patients who have never really experienced headaches. If you're one of those lucky people who's never had a headache, cross your fingers that you stay that way because especially in people who have never had a headache, these can be very, very alarming. Um, people like me who get migraines, you know, I get a bad run of headaches and I'm pretty miserable, but I'm not scared. People who don't normally get headaches and who show up with these brand new headache syndromes, it's a very scary thing for them. These headaches take many forms. They can be daily persistent headaches, meaning all day, every day with very few breaks in between. They can be daily episodic headaches, meaning they can last from minutes to hours um, and come daily. Or they can just be a ramping up in frequency and intensity of the patient's previous headaches. And if you look over here to this graph on the right, um, you'll see that uh, these are self-reported symptoms of 14 to 21 days later among uh, recovered COVID patients. You'll see that a good chunk of them um, had more than one symptom, but you see here fatigue, cough, and right there, headache. Um, and it's, it's, a big, it's a big problem for these patients. So next. So who gets it? It's not just people with COVID. I mean that too, but persistent headaches uh, seem to be more prevalent in certain patient populations. Um, Females tend to get the brunt of this. If you have a loss of taste or smell during your infection, you're also more susceptible if you pop a fever. And interestingly, patients who have exhibited GI symptoms have been shown to have a higher instance of headache. So what do we do about it? Well, when we don't know where to start, you start with what works for other things. Some drugs in the literature have shown efficacy. Gabapentin, which generally isn't great for primary headache disorders, has been shown to reduce some of the disease burden um, of headache in COVID. 
uh, post-COVID headaches. So you can go up as high as 900 TID on gabapentin. Um, you just have to monitor for things like GI side effects and somnolence. But um, you would usually use the 300 milligram pills and just three times a day and add one pill per week um, until you've titrated up. Topamax up to 100 milligrams twice a day. Now this is a high dose for a headache patient. Um, this is the kind of dose that we see in epileptics and seizure patients when we're trying to control, um, trying to control those. Uh, normally headaches, standard dose of 50 milligrams twice a day is where we go. Staying away from NSAIDs in the acute phase, it doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, Post recovery is okay. Uh, doesn't doesn't do a whole lot. It's kind of like using a garden hose on a house fire. Uh, triptans have been shown to be okay, um, less less than fifty percent efficacy. But you know, if you're in that thirty percent, that's something. Um, many of these headaches patients complain specifically of light sensitivity, which can be mitigated by doing things like screen covering, sunglasses, and avoiding direct light. These headaches do get better. Um, it just takes time. Some people can, can go a couple of months. Um, some people, two or three weeks is usually what I'm seeing. Next slide, please. Vertigo and imbalance. Now this can happen in association with the headaches, but sometimes it occurs by itself. Um, these patients will describe varying types of vertigo, uh, either a feeling of the room spinning or a feeling of them spinning in a still room. Not usually uh, lightheadedness, but more actual vertigo. Um, these patients may benefit from a short course of meclizine, not chronic meclizine use, so not like dosing it three times a day, but um, just a short course of meclizine use. Long-term results have actually been pretty promising with balance and physical therapy. And let me bring up that when I say long-term, it's September. This started in February. Long-term is a, I mean, it's kind of a optimistic <laughs> uh, word to use here. But so far, we've seen good results with things like balanced physical therapy. And if you're not sure if the physical therapy center that you're sending to has balanced physical therapy available, call and ask. If they have balanced therapy available, they'll be able to tell you. There are certain PTs that can do it and certain devices that are, that are useful um, for that. Also, take a look at the patient's medications. You guys are experts at picking up on polypharmacy. Use that knowledge. Look at that med list and tell and see if there's anything on your patient that even if it hadn't before is currently contributing to, wait, really? Ha, that's cute. Adam, do we want to advance the slides? Well, that was a cute trick. My computer turned off. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, where was I? I'm sorry. I was talking about balance therapy, I believe. So, and look at the medication list and see if there's anything on there that could possibly be affecting your patient. Even if it's something that wasn't affecting them before, take a look and see what can possibly be peeled off and that might be helpful. Slide, please. So brain fog. Well, apparently I did the animation wrong on that slide. Uh, can you hit next, please? Just bring that whole slide up. There we go. Brain fog is an extremely common complaint following prolonged or even mild illness. So even if somebody just has really light on the, um, on the COVID symptoms, they may experience this brain fog going forward. Patients complain of things like not being able to focus or carry thoughts through all the way through to things like not remembering um, appointments and not, not feeling 
one patient told me that he feels like he doesn't know his own house. Like he'll walk around the corner and be surprised by something that's been there for years. And, you know, he'll stop and he'll refocus himself. But that's a very disorienting thing for people. Recommendations for this. Assess sleep. Um, especially look for things like sleep apnea, things that can lower these patients' reserve um, to deal with these effects of COVID-19. Um, consider a neuropsych evaluation and track it over time. A neuropsych evaluation is great, but it's even better if you go back and revisit it six or 12 months later. We'll give it one second here while Dr. Katsafanis tries to reconnect. I apologize about the technical difficulties. I want to move, we'll move to, to Dr. Uh, Dominic Angelolo, um, who's going to present the cardiovascular perspective, and then we'll, we'll try to come back to, to Dr. Katsafanis after Dr. Jones. We'll, we'll catch back and uh, talk a little bit of brain fog and uh, you know, some of the manifestations that uh, she didn't get a chance to finish. So, so thank you. So Dr. Angelolo, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you, Chris, and thanks for the invite. Uh, so I'll be speaking about uh, cardiovascular considerations in the outpatient setting. Uh, however, uh, I will give some brief introduction on uh, what happens in the inpatient setting because it's important to understand the pathophysiology uh, for the cardiovascular implications. These are my uh, disclosures. Next. So uh, uh, as we all know, the COVID-19 uh, starts off as a, a pulmonary uh, a disorder. I'm not gonna speak about this, but uh, it's important to understand how the whole process uh, uh, takes place. And you see here at the top of my slide, I do indicate that this is also a thrombotic uh, a disorder. And why is this a thrombotic disorder? So thrombotic disorder, because as we, as you can see from this cartoon, the uh, uh, inflammatory status uh, affects the alveolus and the uh, surrounding uh, vasculature. And so by definition, uh, this inflammation, which affects the endothelial cells, and as the inflammatory status uh, propagates, also uh, uh, promotes a procoagulant status. Next slide. So uh, this is a, 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 a different cartoon, kind of a little bit expanding uh, what I showed in the prior slide, uh, showing how uh, there is a, a so-called phenomenon of endotelitis. And so this inflammatory status of the uh, uh, endothelium uh, promotes uh, a platelet adhesion activation and subsequent aggregation in addition to activation of the coagulation cascade. And uh, in turn, what we have seen over the course of the past six months is a number uh, of thrombotic complications, uh, which include uh, uh, PE, DVT, uh, MIs, and stroke, plus a number of other very bizarre and rare uh, arterial thrombotic complications. Next. And we uh, speak about uh, uh, COVID-19 as a thrombotic disorder, but in reality, this goes through different stages because there is some confusion between uh, the uh, component of thrombosis on one hand and hemorrhage on the other. So. One says, well, what happens first? Well, you can see here we have different stages, stages uh, that go in parallel with the uh, pulmonary disorder. Uh, we have a so-called uh, uh, associated hemostatic abnormalities where we start off uh, as a thrombotic disorder and uh, high levels of D-dimers, fibrinogen, and then it's only towards the end that do we have a consumptive coagulopathy that can lead to a DIC and therefore a hemorrhagic disorder. So this happens uh, uh, very much towards the uh, end phases of the, uh, the disease. 
next. So uh, the other question that comes up, which prevails, the uh, uh, thromboembolism or arterial thrombotic disorders? And it really depends on what are the factors that are being involved that lead to thrombus formation. And we know from the uh, uh, Virchow striad, we have endothelial injury, hypercoagulability, and abnormal blood flow. Typically, if you have a phenomenon of stasis plus plasma factors that are being affected, then it's more, you more commonly have thromboembolism. If on the other hand, uh, we have uh, a hyper uh, coagulable status due to platelets, then we have more arterial thrombotic disorders. Next. And when we look at the heart, there are many, many mechanisms through which we have uh, cardiac injury, in addition to a direct cardiac injury because the ACE2 receptor is also on the myocardium. We have these fulminant myocarditis. Uh, we most commonly have type two myocardial infarction. Why? These are sick patients. They have low levels of oxygen. And so it's a very intuitive uh, that the type two MI, in other words, the mismatch between supply and demand is very common. Nevertheless, uh, because of the systemic inflammation, uh, there's also a propensity towards plaque rupture and type one MIs. So we see a lot of this in the, in the acute setting. We need to distinguish between these two categories because obviously one group uh, does not require invasive management while the other does with aggressive antithrombotic therapies. Next. I'll move forward with the anticoagulation aspect. This is something that I've been working on with a number of national and international societies since the very beginning on what do we do with, with these patients. And the first evidence actually on uh, this being a thrombotic disorder uh, derives from uh, uh, autopsy studies from Northern Italy, from, from Bergamo, uh, where uh, I have worked a lot with my colleagues uh, uh, in that uh, in that region, and uh, and that's really where the whole process started. Of let's start to anticoagulate these these patients. I'm going to make a very long story short because we're supposed to speak about the long term. Uh, but the classical questions: which when to start, which drug, which dose, and how long? Next. For the most part, we want to start early. Uh, the drug of choice becomes low molecular heparin. We can speak for an entire day on the reasons why. Uh, we start off with prophylactic doses, but there is some data now that we would go with full therapeutic doses or targeted doses. And the question is for how long? This becomes for you. So many of these patients, the, the, for many of these patients, the decisions are being made in the hospital. So you may have patients who have, may not have had a thrombotic disorder, but remains at a low bleeding risk, but still high thrombotic risk, where the international consensus that the patient should be continuing for 14 to 30 days uh, with a, a NOAC. Next. Obviously, the situation is a little bit different for those patients who had a true thrombotic disorder, which is like any a patient who developed a DVT or a P, you keep these patients on a longer term treatment. Next. One of the rationales why, particularly in the early phase, we were considering not doing an, a NOAC in, in the hospital uh, was related to drug drug interactions, but uh, because of the antivirals, but now we've sorted the antivirals out. They do remain a, 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 an option. But one of the advantages that we have with low molecular weight heparins, uh, not only in the hospital, but also out, is that they do interact with the spike, uh, with the spike protein of, of, of the virus. But something just to be aware of if uh, you, you have a patient who's on experimental therapies. Next. Now, a big, big question uh, that I get a lot of phone calls uh, about for the patient who tests positive, has a, a cardiovascular disease, you know, what do you do with their antithrombotics? And uh, we know that our cardiovascular patients are more commonly affected by the virus, but we also know that symptoms for the most part are mild or not present at all. And the reason why I think this is such an important topic is unfortunately, uh, there's been also a lot of commercial interest uh, on behalf of many of the makers of the novel oral anticoagulants uh, to uh, uh, promote the use of NOAX in some of these settings, particularly because one of the agents also has an indication for vascular protection. Uh, 
It's the 2.5 milligram of, of, of raroxidan. The very simple take home message is do not switch therapy. Just do not switch therapy. If the patient's fine, do not switch therapy. Because one thing that we do know is switching therapy, and I've been working on switching antithrombotics for the past 20 years, is associated with an increased risk of bleeding. So if the patient doesn't have any symptoms, mild symptoms, we'll leave them alone on the antithrombotics that they're, are, they're already on. Next. And also be mindful, even there, there are a number of drug-drug interactions with, the anti, with some of the antithrombotics. In patients who are coming in with acute MI, we are favoring uh, Prasugrel over the other uh, uh, agents since, simply because this is the agent less prone to any type of drug-drug interactions. Again, many times we do not know if a patient goes to a floor uh, and be uh, treated with experimental uh, therapy. So again, very important to keep the patients on what they are already on. Next. The other big question is, and I get this all the time when I'm walking around in my neighborhood, should I pop a baby aspirin or take some medication if, even if I don't have cardiovascular disease? The answer is we do not know. We do not know. It's a very important question. We do know, and if we go to the next slide, we do know that uh, patients who may get tested are fine, but slowly develop symptoms when they are at home. We know that some of these patients do develop thrombotic complications. Now, because of this, uh, there is a, an NIH trial, which is called ACTIVE-4, and uh, we will be starting to enroll in this trial uh, uh, as early as of next week. For patients who are positive for COVID-19, they're not sick enough to be hospitalized, but they have some parameters, for example, elevated C-reactive protein or, or an elevated D-dimer, but not, again, not sick enough to be hospitalized to answer this question. Should be they taking an antithrombotic agent and which one? So it's gonna be a prospective randomized placebo-controlled trial uh, where there are four arms, placebo, aspirin, a pixaban 2.5 or a pixaban uh, 5.0, both twice daily. And uh, this will be, uh, the first study to evaluate this issue in the outpatient setting. So you may be getting phone calls from people in our group because we believe that this is a very, very important question. Next. The other big question that has emerged from the very beginning, as soon as the word ACE2 popped up and this virus interacts with this receptor, and we know that this receptor is very important. And we know that a lot of our patients, again, 70, 80% of patients in the initial experience had hypertension. A lot of physicians were concerned. What happens if a patient is on an ACE2 inhibitor? Should we stop? Should we, should we start? Should we, we switch them all to amlodipine? What do we do? Okay, the answer is here. Again, next slide. Do not do anything. Keep the patient on their standard of care treatment. This is one of the earlier uh, 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 studies published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, again, a retrospective study, uh, no impact whatsoever uh, of being on an ACE inhibitor uh, or an ARB on, uh, on uh, differential outcomes. Uh, there's been some issues in the literature with some data that was ultimately retracted. Again, the recommendation is not to switch uh, a treatment. There's already one prospective randomized study, which was presented at the, uh, uh, at the uh, ESC not too long ago, um, performed in Brazil, no differences whatsoever. Next slide. But it's such a relevant topic. You go click, click, click. <laughs> we have at least 15 trials addressing this topic in a prospective randomized fashion. So again, for the time being, do not change. Next slide. And I'm gonna ask next, okay, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on, on this slide because this is again, very, very relevant for your clinical practice. Uh, the so-called COVID-19 long haulers, and you probably heard about, about this term. Some people have defined them as those patients with possibility of 100 different type signs or symptoms lasting for over 100 days. These are the patients who uh, 
are positive and not necessarily sick, not necessarily those who have been hospitalized, who have tested positive, uh, had a fever or something along those lines, shortness of breath at home, and they persist with these symptoms, right? They persist, they go on for weeks and weeks. They're, they're negative at, at a certain point and they're going on with these symptoms. This is one of the biggest issues right now that we're dealing in the cardiovascular world and you're probably seeing it in your office because the patients come with these very nonspecific symptoms, this fatigue, this shortness of breath, this atypical chest pain, depression, anxiety, muscle aches, palpitations, right? And so particularly when you have chest pain, palpitations, shortness of breath, what do you do? Go to the cardiologist. So we see these patients in our office and we start off, we get an EKG. Sometimes the EKG is normal. Sometimes the EKG shows some subtle changes. Uh, what do you do with them? They may have palpitations, you may get a whole thermometer. At the end of the day, uh, we are getting a to the echo on these patients and maybe a stress test. Is this important? I think the answer is yes, because a lot of these patients, as I mentioned before, may have some type of myocarditis. Uh, they may have a low EF and not know about it. Maybe they're, they were tough enough to stay at home and not go to the hospital and they have a low EF and you need to know what's going on. I can tell you last week alone, I did three heart cats on patients who were never hospitalized, went to the clinic and had a low EF. And they have a low EF, you gotta rule out uh, underlying conditions. So we do this and uh, hopefully many times the tests come back normal and you do not move forward. Uh, some may order cardiac MRI, it's more for investigational purposes. This is being done a lot in athletes, particularly soccer players in, in Europe. Many of these patients are getting cardiac MRIs. You probably, if you like soccer like I do, uh, a lot of coronavirus going on among soccer players in Europe. Many of these getting car cardiac MRIs showing this persistent inflammation. And as mentioned uh, before, some of these ultimately end up getting a, a heart cat to rule out any uh, underlying coronary artery disease. So having said this, uh, I think it's appropriate to send these patients to uh, the cardiologist because we do wanna uh, make sure that there aren't any underlying conditions. Many times COVID unravels an underlying cardiovascular uh, condition uh, and it does provide reassurance sometimes to the patient and obviously to the uh, provider sending us the patients if everything comes back normal. So having said this, I'd like to thank everybody for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Angelo, uh, for just incredible information from the cardiac perspective. Uh, next, we're going to move to Dr. Uh, Lisa Jones. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, long-term pulmonary impact of COVID-19. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Scuderi and all for having me this evening. Next slide, please. As you can see, this slide was recently updated on October 8th. You can see the impact, and this is based on the Johns Hopkins Global Dashboard. Confirmed cases globally, deaths, and recovery. Unfortunately, in all of those categories, the United States is not winning. And I was speaking with my colleagues earlier. Um, my daughter is an international student, and she is in school now in Germany, just going back from the United States about a month ago. And we just found out today that her school, seventh grade and above, have been closed until further notice. Next slide, please. So as we all well know at this point, routes of transmission, it is in the pulmonary system through aerosolized, through um, uh, droplets, air droplets, and fomites. So that's through contact that's going to be mouth, nose, and eyes, mostly the respiratory system. And that's where we're testing the viral load is most concentrated in the anterior and posterior nasal pharyngeal system. Next slide, please. So again, person-to-person -person spread in the predominant mode is through the respiratory system. So how is that? That's through coughing, through sneezing, or talking, singing. And a high-level viral shedding is evident, again, in the upper respiratory system. And we've actually found out um, in children that it's even a higher concentration. Um, the viral, the virus, 
cannot, is not typically cultured nine days after symptom onset. And that's typically with mild, mild disease. We have tested patients positive for up to 42 days in the hospital. And we need two negative tests to say that that patient is negative. But at this point, the highest has been 42 days. Multiple studies have described correlation between reduced infectivity with decreased viral loads, that makes sense, and rises in neutralizing antibodies. And our data also indicates thus far, and this is up to about July, um, that vertical transmission appears to be uncommon. Next slide, please. So what are the typical manifestations of COVID-19? Again, in mild disease, about 80% of symptomatic patients, you're going to, within about two days of exposure, fever, runny nose, sore throat, or dry cough. And what we've noticed, um, like our neurologist was speaking of, is a loss of smell. And that's a very common um, symptom that I have personally noticed in the younger population. That correlates typically with a positive test. And your chest x-ray at that point is typically normal. And those patients are not, in my experience thus far, hospitalized, but those are the patients that the family medicine physicians and our internal medicine physicians are seeing in their outpatient clinics. Next slide. Again, primary symptoms, headaches, sore throat, body aches, all of those symptoms, and again, can appear within two to 14 days of exposure to the virus. Next slide, please. In moderate to severe disease, and this is when myself as a pulmonologist doing consults in the internal medicine inpatient service or dealing with patients that have been moved to the intensive care unit requiring high levels of supplemental oxygen. That's moderate to severe disease. And what we are noticing within about day six, you'll have ground glass opacities or very hazy opacities that are correlating with hypoxemia. And we see in early respiratory disease, when we still have good lung compliance and low lung elastins, therefore those patients are, are less responsive to PEEP. So we can get away with using supplemental nasal cannula oxygen. As the disease progresses, what we are noticing is that the lungs become less compliant and we're requiring increased levels of PEEP to achieve that level of oxygenation. And we are noticing that those patients are progressing to a very similar um, physiology of ARDS, and that's later on in the disease. And again, as Dr. Angelio was speaking of, it's that endothelial damage that is the disruption in the pulmonary vasoregulation, which leads to the VQ mismatch, which is the pathophysiology behind the hypoxemia. Next slide, please. This shows those ground glass opacities that we can see on CT scan. And this is almost to the point pathognomonic in this day and age of a COVID-19 infection correlating with a moderate to severe disease. Next slide, please. So why is SARS-CoV-19 more contagious than the other coronaviruses. Again, as we marked on before, the spike protein binds to the ACE2 re receptor on human cells at least 10 times more tightly than the corresponding spike protein for other coronaviruses. Next slide, please. This leads to the cytokine storm, which we've looked at this um, pathophysiology for therapy, which has not led to a lot of success, but this leads to that permeability of the, the alveolus and the endothelium around that leading to 
what looks like pulmonary edema, those ground glass opacities on your CT scans and chest x-ray, those hazy looking lungs. This is what the cytokine storm causes. Next slide, please. We'll touch just briefly on current treatment protocols because we have been learning as it has been coming at us. Early on, we called out um, to our fellows in training, our past fellows that have trained with us before that were in New York City, and we started talking to them what was working early on. Next slide, please. The big thing that we realized that was working early on was corticosteroids. Also speaking with um, our fellow colleagues and then with our own personal experience, remdesivir. Next slide, please. Dexamethasone is what we typically use with mild to moderate disease. And you'll see in a brief study that Dexamethasone is not indicated and is not beneficial until the patient is requiring supplemental oxygen or a, a SAO2, a pulse ox reading of 94% or less. And we're using a five to 10 day course depending on those inflammatory markers. Next slide, please. Again, you can see here those patients who did not require oxygen did no better than just good chicken noodle soup, vitamin C, getting up, moving around, and staying well hydrated. Patients that did need oxygen moving on to high um, flow oxygen requirements and even BiPAP, what we have noticed, and this is again, um, more personal experiences and speaking with other colleagues in different institutions, when we were first dealing with this virus, we were using solumedrol and we were um, dividing it twice a day. And that was when patients were coming into more of a step down or more of an ICU setting. And then we were using a taper and we seem to have better outcomes there. Um, we did go to, when this evidence came out, we went to the dexamethasone and we were finding that once we completed that course, that patients were having a spike in their inflammatory markers and they were having a few days step back of their clinical improvement. So we went back to using solumedrol. Next slide, please. With using remdesivir, and you can see here that remdesivir is a nucleoside analog of ATP that competes with the ATP for inclusion, therefore, um, therefore delaying the chain termination and interfering with RNA replication. This has been studied for years in different disease processes and um, speaking with colleagues and in our own experience, if you start this early, it'll buy you some good time and you can decrease that viral replication. Next slide, please. You can see here um, patients who, uh, this is between, yes, patients who had very severe disease who received a 10-day course, there was no difference in observed time to um, clinical improvement or duration on a mechanical ventilator. This is in severe disease. Next slide, please. This shows that there is not a difference in a five-day course versus a 10-day course, again, in severe disease. What we are noticing is we, if we apply the same um, criteria to, of dexamethasone to a remdesivir, so when patients are starting to require oxygen, that's when you start this. And then you can, you can decrease that viral load and hopefully keep your patients out of the ICU. Next slide, please. Tocalizumab, we were approached and we were excited about this. Speaking to colleagues across the country and actually across the world, this was um, not giving us the bang for the buck that we were hoping it would by calming down that cytokine storm that we had seen this medication being used before. It um, targets IL-6. We were very, very optimistic about this, but unfortunately um, the, the companies have stopped calling us and they have pulled back and we are not enrolling. So this is not promising. Next slide, please. 
convalescent plasma, lots of conversation about convalescent plasma, and we're lucky at the um, University of Florida that we have access to remdesivir, we have access to tocalizumab through our research trials, and we have access through convalescent plasma. Those are all through, um, the convalescent plasma and the remdesivir are through EUAs. We have used convalescent plasma twice, and again, I believe if we have the opportunity to to use early in patients that are not candidates for remdesivir. This is where we see the indication. And most of our patients, we've been able to utilize remdesivir when indicated. Next slide, please. Anticoagulation, I do believe that Dr. Angelio um, reviewed that very, very well. And we have noticed personally um, that this is a highly thrombotic um, virus. And if you do not follow your inflammatory markers to include a D-dimer and stay on top of um, your patient's prophylaxis and when you need to, their therapeutic anticoagulation, you can get into trouble. And we have noticed that patients will be doing well. They'll be doing so well from a respiratory standpoint. They'll be on nasal cannula. They'll be working with OTPT. And you feel like you've won this one. And all of a sudden, they have a devastating, catastrophic pulmonary embolism. It's, it's devastating. Next slide, please. Long-term prognosis and follow-up. Next slide. There is, of course, limited data because we have, again, just been dealing with this since February. And in Jacksonville, Florida, we really have, you know, we had our big spike in July. And now we are starting to see patients in clinic. But per other coronaviruses and the pathophysiology, of course, we can expect that there's going to be significant neurologic, cardiovascular, and pulmonary um, long-term outcomes. So this is why we're talking about this this evening. Next slide, please. So potential pulmonary problems, and we are already seeing some of these while patients are recovering in the hospital. We have had some patients that have, our longest patient has been in the hospital since April and still dealing with a fibrotic lung process, chronic cough, we've seen bronchiectasis, pulmonary vascular disease um, with pulmonary hypertension, and profound polyneuropathy. This just wipes people out. Next slide, please. We can see here, of course, post-mortem, that that diffuse alveolar damage that is noted in um, autopsy, it is a microscopic platelet fibrin thrombi-rich disease, not only venous, but arterial thrombotic disease. And that is why, again, Dr. Angelio pointed out that we really need to look at um, discharge from hospital and, you know, relying on our, our outpatient physicians to work with us to figure out what the appropriate post-discharge anticoagulation prophylaxis is going to be for these patients, because this is a huge complication, and this is why these patients, I believe, are having significant problems with um, cardiac issues, neurologic issues, and definitely pulmonary issues. Next slide, please. So the British Thoracic Society, um, they are looking at chest x-rays three months after discharge for all patients that were admitted to the hospital or with a history of moderate to severe disease or with persisting symptoms or radiologic abnormalities. Those patients require clinical review and further investigation. And this is through the national health um, system. So they're looking to recruit 10,000 patients in the UK to hopefully provide us more of a comprehensive picture of long-term effects. We have um, discussed amongst ourselves in our pulmonary division that we would like to see any patient that was discharged from the hospital um, that had COVID-19. We would like to see them in our pulmonary department so that we could get 
pulmonary function test on those patients so that we can follow along and see what these um, long-term effects are going to be. In discussion amongst ourselves and editorials, um, they're looking at the medications that we use for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, mostly nintinanab or OFEB or perfidodone, um, otherwise known as Esprit. Looking at that in these patients with progressive pulmonary um, fibrosis after um, COVID-19. And it's interesting to see this process because these patients are treated with, you know, pretty high dose steroids. So you would, you would think the opposite would occur, but it sure does not. Next slide. I think that actually might be it. Excellent. Well, we'll talk, thank you so much, Dr. Jones. This is fantastic. And so just want to remind um, everyone in the audience that we do have some time for questions and answers. I'm going to loop back quickly to Dr. Kat Safanis. We had some uh, technical difficulties, but, but we're back. And so she's going to finish a, a, a couple slides and bring up a couple key points. But um, if you do have any questions or answers for our excellent panelists tonight, you know, please submit them now. And so Dr. Kat Safanis, welcome back. Thank you. I am like a bad penny. We've gone through a computer and a cell phone, and now we're on the iPad. So um, here we are. So I was just finishing up, and I was talking about um, this awful brain fog and this memory issue that people have. And what I really wanted to come back and tell you is one of the best kept secrets of neurologists, and don't tell them I told you or I will have to turn in my little brain card, speech therapy works for cognition. Speech therapists are very well trained to deal with things like um, this, this persistent brain fog and word finding difficulty and memory issues. So utilize your SLPs, utilize your speech language pathologists. Um, if you're part of the UF network, we have wonderful ones. But any, any SLP that you guys normally send to, think about using them for this, for this cognitive type rehab, you can put in the comments for referral for communication purposes. Um, limit your sedating medications. And as I was saying, consider neuropsych evals and track the evaluation over time. Make sure you address underlying factors like headaches, sleep apnea, and stress. And these things will all lead to these patients becoming better. Um, in listening to Dr. Jones and Dr. Angelila's uh, presentations, I realized that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the multiple sclerosis patients that I'm sure many of you guys see. And I'm sure that you guys have the same question that a lot of neurologists who don't see a lot of MS has, which is, should my patients stop their disease-modifying therapy because we're in the middle of the pandemic? Should my patient with neuromyelitis optica come off their rituxan because it affects B cells and it affects immunity? The answer to that is a resounding no. Um, whereas rituxan use has been um, linked to more severe disease in patients with multiple medical comorbidities, the risk versus benefit analysis of taking a patient with a severe demyelinating or autoimmune disorder off of a drug like rituxan is far and away um, a bigger risk to take them off that therapy. So please, um, if you have patients with multiple sclerosis or anything like that, please leave them on their therapy and feel free to refer to um, your neurologic colleagues because they'll definitely help you out. And that's all I have. So sorry for the technical difficulties again. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I appreciate uh, just the three of you. And so a couple quick questions. Um, the first would be for Dr. Katsafana. So if you have a patient that does come in with brain fog and um, you're concerned about them driving, what is some tips that you could give family physicians on whether this patient's safe to drive or safe to work? So safe, safe to drive and safe to work are so hard. Um, I usually send for a um, physical or occupational therapy assessment, and they'll, they'll assess things like, especially OT, they'll assess things like spatial awareness and um, reaction time. It's the, same, it's the same type of approach that I take um, when somebody sends me, you know, one of the extended disability forms that I'm sure you guys have seen. I can't tell you if a patient can stand for six hours. I can't tell you how many times they can lift 20 pounds. So I'll refer usually to a physical medicine um, rehabilitation program or a place like in Jacksonville, we have a hospital called Brooks, which is like a rehab uh, 
um, a rehab network that's very good for assessing those type of things. I think it's really difficult um, as a general practitioner or even as a subspecialist like myself to kind of put my nickel down and say, yes, you can drive because so much goes into that. There's reaction time, um, there's spatial awareness, and there's of course cognitive awareness. Like if somebody is walking into their living room and are surprised that their sofa's there, I don't want them driving. But I don't have any real way to assess that unless the patient tells me. So I would, um, you know, for my not answer, I apologize. But uh, I would probably have that assessed by a patient who could do more of a functional assessment rather than putting your nickel down. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, the next question is for Dr. Jones. So um, for the patients who are coming to us, family physicians with mild COVID symptoms, is there anything that would be proven in the outpatient setting that we could do to help them or anything for symptomatic treatment that's recommended? Unfortunately, recommendations that are backed by good literature, no. What we're telling people, making sure that you are well hydrated, good vitamin C, good vitamin D, melatonin, um, avoiding NSAIDs, and, and just, you know, making sure that you're getting up and you're being as active as possible. And um, if patients do have access to a pulse oximeter, which I know a lot of people don't, but, you know, to keep track of that. And if we're dipping low, you know, lower than 94%, then it's probably time to, you know, come in and, and get on a little bit of oxygen and see what the inflammatory markers are. That's when we're telling people to come on in. But it's hard to, you know, deal with just mild symptoms, but we're not recommending starting um, um, steroids, not recommending starting steroids unless the patient is requiring supplemental oxygen. Thank you. And so the, the next question is uh, for Dr. Angelo and the group. It said, um, let me pull this up here. And so um, it, it, in the whole group, you know, uh, when do antiplatelets only, uh, when do you use antiplatelets only, anticoagulants only, or both? A very good question. I only when there's an indication. So if the patient uh, is uh, has never been hospitalized at home and they're on an antiplatelet, continue with what they're taking. If they're on an anticoagulant, continue with what they're taking. The combination of the two is really reserved uh, for those patients with uh, concomitant uh, uh, thromboembolic and arterial comorbidities. And that's not uh, uh, a good situation because we know that these patients have a very, very high uh, risk of, of, of bleeding. Uh, I do believe that if you have a patient like this, the decision is typically made in the hospital and these patients should be followed very closely by, uh, by the cardiologist uh, because we do have some uh, timing in which we may stop the aspirin and just keep them uh, on a specific P2I12 inhibitor plus an anticoagulant and maybe at a specific dose. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Jones. Uh, it said it was mentioned that patients have been positive for up to 42 days. Assuming they are now asymptomatic, are there any signs or symptoms to look forward to, to determine how effective they are? Good question. And those are the patients that I'm seeing that are still in the hospital, that are still in the hospital, that are still requiring oxygen. It's just a very, in some patients, it just is persistent. And that's even after um, steroid courses and after remdesivir. So just some patients just continue to have that viral shed and remain positive. And again, we make sure that we have two positive tests before we either send them to um, a, a floor bed that is a non-COVID unit or before sending them out to a um, rehab facility. Thank you. And, and so we're, we're coming, to, coming to the end. It's, it's nine o'clock and so um, just if you have any other questions, do you want to send them? We'll be able to send them to the speakers over the um, next uh, couple of days. So just if you have any, you know, please keep them in, and, and we will definitely send them out to the speakers. But um, 
I just want to just thank our, our three speakers tonight. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, just just incredible information on uh, you know timely topic and, and just some great take homes um, from neurology, um, from from cardiology and from pulmonary. And so just we're very grateful for your expertise tonight and uh, just for uh, the time you spent with us. And so I just want to thank um, Dr. Katsapanis, Dr. Angelo, and Dr. Jones. It's just terrific job tonight. And uh, just all the family physicians in Florida, thank you. Uh, for, for sharing this time with us. Um, any last statements that you, you want to let the group know? Just keep yourself safe out there. I mean, we talk about the physicians who see patients in the hospital as being front lines, and sometimes we don't really consider and think about the fact that you guys are out there seeing these patients every day, both when they're acutely ill, before they're diagnosed, while they're being shepherded through their illness, and then, you know, on the back end when you're dealing with all these sequelae. But, you know, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves so that you can continue to care for others. I personally like to say my thanks to, to you, Chris. I, uh, I know there's a lot of work behind this as you've been doing a great job uh, since the start of this pandemic. So thanks for all your efforts. And I echo both of my colleagues. This is wonderful. Welcome to do anytime again. And colleagues, please stay safe, keep your family safe and wear your mask. Well, thank you. And, and so I'm, I'm, you know, would like to finish up tonight by just thanking our three speakers, but also I'm pleased to announce the confirmation of our next webinar topic and presenter um, as seen on our final slide. On December 3rd, we have Dr. Jonathan Tempty, who is a family physician and uh, associate dean from the University of Wisconsin. He serves on the CDC Board of Scientific Counselors in the Office of Infectious Disease. In addition to that impressive resume, he's also one of the leading family experts in the country on vaccines and was chair of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ASEP, from 2012 to 2015. And he's a current member of the ASEP COVID-19 Vaccine Workgroup. Uh, he's the only family physician that's on it. Um, during his presentation, he'll be addressing COVID vaccine development and expected efficacy. And this is a particularly timely topic concerning the importance of developing an effective vaccine to combat the COVID pandemic during these rapidly evolving circumstances. I want to thank you all tonight for joining us and to not forget to visit the FAP website, FAP.org, for late-breaking information concerning the COVID-19 pandemic and to listen to any past webinars. All webinars have been uh, recorded and are under there to be viewed. Uh, we appreciate all the work family physicians are doing on behalf of your patients here in the state of Florida. Keep up the great work and be well, stay safe, and have a great night.